How did you find out that Daryl was leaving at the end of the 86 season to join Hendrick? He not really announced it that first of that year. Uh, later on, he had pretty much decided he was going to leave. Him and Junior weren't getting along, but they thought the world of each other. Um, I think it was a deal where Daryl wanted to get better and move forward in a lot of areas that we weren't. And he thought, well, going with Hendricks, everything, you know, with Waddell and the dream team, Randy Dorton and all them, he could start working on things would start improving from the way he wanted it. Basically, we were like a second-rate team to him at that time. But he won races. We won races that year with him. And uh, basically at Watkins Glen, when he finally sat down and, you know, told us, I'm gone. And, and y'all going to start hearing things. I'm going and everything else. So that's when we started working on getting another driver. Well, I'll be honest with you. Junior wanted to hire Dale Earnhardt. It was a known fact. He loved Dale. He was a he was friend, him and Ralph were friends. And Budweiser wouldn't let him. Budweiser did not want him to hire Dale for some reason. Who knows back then? So after that, basically, he asked me, and Terry's contract was up at uh, Billy's, and he was ready to leave. He said, I want you to call Terry and tell him to come see me. I said, okay. So I called Terry that night from my house, told him, I said, listen, I said, when can you come up here and talk with Junior? He said, what, what about? I said, I don't know. He just wants to talk to you. He said, well, I'll work on that. I said, what I do? He said, what's the number that I can get a hold of him at? And I gave him Junior's number, 2101. I'll never forget it. And, uh. Next thing, about a week later, I'm coming back from lunch, and I meet this junior's uh, explorer coming out. Oh, no, it was Fort Suburban at that time, coming out of the driveway, and I look, and Terry's in the passenger seat. And Bill Lawrence, which was a great friend of Terry's, was uh, with him. He was kind of like Terry's back man, you know. Yeah. And that's how we got Terry. Well, <clears throat> back when you uh, Junior had two teams, mm -hmm. right? Uh, number one, how how big a role do you guys play in hiring the you know the members of the second team? Oh, we had a big role in it. And what was the dynamic like between the two teams? It was good. Mm -hmm. See, what we wanted Junior to do is we wanted him, and we begged him to do it like this. We wanted him to put Tim Brewer in charge. Hammond had already left. Okay. He, we wanted him to put Brewer in charge of both teams. Let me be Terry Scrucci. Let Mike Hill be Sterling. Because Sterling and Mike were, they had a, you know, they'd known each other since they were kids too. And, but, in the now, background. Was that, was that with? Um, Sterling. Was that okay? That was with Bill and Sterling, correct? No, that was with Terry and Sterling. Sterling. No, Jeff and Jeff and. Okay, all right. Gotcha. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, with yeah, Jeff yeah. and okay. I, I right. got yeah. messed gotcha. up. Yeah. And Terry had done well. It was Jeff. I was going to be Jeff Scrooge because we had race modifieds against each other, and I thought the world Jeff put down. I thought he was a great, great racer, and still is. And, um, but in the background, we had Banjo Matthews back here telling him he needs to hire Mike Bean to run Sterling's deal. And he kept bragging me about it. Finally, we start building cars, getting cars ready to go. You know, we thought we was going down the same road that we had planned on and everything's going to be great. Then all of a sudden, Mike Bean shows up. And when he shows up and... We had to go back to the way we were before that, uh, which we was okay with that. Don't get me wrong. We all loved working together. Uh, after that, it was kind of like after a couple months, it was, you know, like 
two lines in the same den. It started getting a little bit crazy. Between the two teams yes. or between Tim and Mike? or uh, Just between the teams, basically. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, that was, yeah, that was, uh, it wasn't a good time by no means. But eventually Mike, you know, took over. 1991, Jeff's with the team, and Junior and Tim wind up getting suspended over a big engine uh, leading into the Winston. <laughs> what happened? Well, I'm not really sure. I've been told all kinds of stories. J.B. Range is the one that built that motor, and he swears up and down he put the wrong crankshaft in. And... I know we'll forget when that happened. Never. It's like a bad dream. We're at, at uh, Charlotte, tearing down. And that's also the same race that Junior spun Billy France out driving the pace car. They had that champion driver championship. The old drivers, yeah, Elmo yeah, and yeah, Junior yeah. and Elmo some of them. Winston the race. Yeah, Elmo yeah. won the race. Yeah. And Junior was leading, and Junior spun Billy France out. Embarrassed Billy, I guess. And that's when him and Billy, their friendship was gone. Over that? A lot of it, and some other things that led up to it. And uh, I know we'll get after the race we turned down, and Bobby Scruggs. Oh, Bobby. Yeah. He's dead now, but he was. A, I love Bobby. Yeah. He come from Franklin County Speedway, and he uh, he was just measuring the stroke and everything on that motor, and it kept coming up a little bit. I mean, not hardly enough. So he says, "I'm not doing. You know, maybe something ain't right here. The piston moving. He did it again. Finally, here come Art Krabs. Art didn't like to anyway. So he says, "What's wrong?" And Bobby kind of pulled him over to the side and told him. Well, Art gets up there and he does. He goes, "Oh God, you know." He says, "Mr. Beatty, Mr. Beatty, come here." Of course, everybody came. And Art couldn't talk like, "Hey, we got a problem here." It was like when he talked, everybody in the garage could hear. Him. And we were in that old garage, old Arca garage, down there next to the hospital deal and all of a sudden they come Beatty and Billy France and I, I me and Billy talked a lot I loved Billy uh, we had a good I had a good relationship with Billy France Jr. and uh, they started talking about it he says well y'all pull that motor out I want that motor Beatty said we'll check it again tomorrow and we'll go from there. So, Billy France, just trying to show his authority, says, I want that intake. Where's the rest of this motor? I was laying on the back of a pickup truck. We was going to put everything in there. He said, I want them, he says, I want them cylinder heads. I want that carburetor. I want that GD this and GD that. And I turned around and told him I wasn't the GD motor man. I was just standing there. And they took everything and took it to Beatty's uh, house, measured it again, showed it like three points too big. And that was the end of it. So then, then that's when all hell broke loose. Uh, Brewer showed his displeasure with the motor builder at that time, there at the shop. We had to go to... <laughs> Uh, Charlotte to run the 600 and Junior and Budweiser kind of helped him make a decision because Tommy Ellis was driving bush cars at that time you know and Junior got him to drive the car I'll never forget it was just we get to the racetrack. They wouldn't even let us park in the same garage. They made us park down there in that old Arca garage. Just us. They gave us a number. 
We put a number on. We had John McKenzie with us from Motorsports Designs, which had a lot of a lot of decals and stuff made up with numbers. Because they wouldn't tell us what number we could have. Well, we'd get, you had to come up the hill to get up on the track. By the time we got to the hill, they stopped Tommy. We said, what's wrong, Tommy? They told me to come back. He backs back into the garage. They come down and says, y'all can't run that number. It's not been okayed. We pull it off, me and Mike Hill. Well, we put them up. They said, this is the number you got right here. Well, we put that number on it. We back out. Pull up the top of the hill and they stop us again. Says so the number hadn't been cleared by NASCAR. He backs back down to the garage. We pulled the number off. Were Put they another doing, number on. Were they doing that just to yank yeah, your chain? Yeah, they were just doing that. Okay. And they and we didn't. Me and Mike had nothing to do with what had went on, but we were paying the price. Yeah. The way we looked at it, we hadn't been done anything wrong. We didn't know what was going on. We was just two people trying to make a living. Well, the third number pulled up there. It didn't pass. Finally, Mike went up to the NASCAR trailer, and pretty much I didn't go because I knew I'd end up getting in trouble. <laughs> and Mike went up there and pretty much said, you know, this is bull crap. There's 30 minutes left of practice. We want a number. They said, well, we'll give you one by the time you get back down there. Well, he come Mike, he walked all the way back down there. And they said, put 97 on it. And that's when we got to number 97. We had 15 minutes of practice. Tommy made about four laps. Practice was over. And that's what they, they had accomplished, exactly what they wanted. Well, Tommy went out there and qualified 14. And we thought, well, you know, we ain't bad. And they just made four laps. Well, during the race, they get us for speeding on pit road. First time I'd heard that in my life, you know, because when, all during my career, it was no pit road speed. Then all of a sudden, after, uh, what's his name, got killed? Mike Rich. Mike Rich. Yeah. Rich uh, Mike Rich, right? What yeah. his name? Got killed at Atlanta. They come up with pit road speed. So then all of a sudden, it's pit road speed. And uh, they said he was speeding on pit road. So we told him he had to do a drive-through. He does drive-through. Well, he was speeding then. Well, Buddy Morrow was a NASCAR official. He comes over to me and says, Buddy, he said, Pete says, Mr. Beatty says, y'all better not speed again. He parked you. Okay. I looked up the tower and I shot him the bird, just like that, you know. And uh, Buddy Moore come over to me, told me that Mr. Beatty said that'd be a five hundred dollars for shooting him the bird. Okay, I stood up on the wall and shot two. <laughs> I turned around and told Buddy, I said, "Tell me, give me a thousand dollars worth." <laughs> and. Uh, but we finished the race that day. I don't know where we finished, but uh, it was it wasn't that I was mad, Dick. I didn't respect, I respected Dick, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I wished he'd have never. <laughs> I wished he could have lived forever, uh, you know, in this sport. And uh, and I apologized to him for it. And uh, Junior paid the fine, um, or Flossie, whoever who took care of it, and. Uh, it was just the fact that everything that had happened in a two weeks span had just finally just took over my emotions. Yeah. And that's the reason I did it. How did you wind up leaving juniors? Were you there when Bill had the strong year in 92? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I left the first of that year. First of that year. And we'd run several races, and Pete Peterson came over to take my place because I had told him I was going to leave. And where were you headed? Hagen okay. with Terry. So I go back over there in the middle of 82 with Terry, 92. 92. But I was still considered part of the team because when I left, I went down to tell Junior I was leaving. He kind of had heard that I was going back to Hagen. 
And I told him I'd stay, you know, I told Brew and all of them I'd stay as long as I could. But Pete had come there, Peterson, and he was going to take my place. And I thought, well, Pete Peterson. And it was a good fix because him and Brewer had worked together at MC Anand back when Kale was driving for him. And uh, I went down there, Junior's washing the dog light out. They all, and I turned around and looked back at the garage, and every one of them was looking at the door because they said, Junior's going to go off when you tell him. He's standing there watching us. Junior, I said, can I talk to you a minute? Yeah, go ahead. And he's still watching. I said, well, I guess you done heard and I was thinking about it. He said, yeah, I kind of heard it. I, he, I said, I'm tired of everybody telling you about it. I'm going to come tell you now. I said, I'll go ahead and work the next race if you want me to. He said, yeah, I'd like for you to go ahead and work that one. And he says, also says, uh, he's still washing there. He turned around and looked at me. And he says, just leave your toolbox here. If you don't work out for you, you need to come back here. Just come on back. I kept washing them. And I turned around and walked back up to the shop, and all the guys were like, holy cow. He didn't go off on you. We think, <laughs> Bruce said, I figured he'd shoot you with a damn water hose. But, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was just a relationship I had with Junior. I mean, we were, I thought the world of him. I've been very fortunate in my career that I can probably name, I, I have worked with some fantastic people uh, that I have really always thought a lot of. Mm-hmm. and been friends. I mean, like Larry McClure tried to get me to come to work with him in Edmonton. He told my son, said, I'll let you go out on the parking lot and pick out any truck you want if you let your daddy come move to Edmonton. And, but I told Larry, I said, listen, we're friends. I come to work for you. That usually ends a friendship somewhere <laughs> down the road. <laughs> same with Bill Davis. Same understand. You know, the morning after Adam got killed, Bill Davis was probably the second person to call me. Really? Uh-huh. Arkansas, Daryl was first. Wow. Because Flossie had called Daryl and told 